see a lot. All right. If you have your Bibles, let's turn to Revelation chapter 6 today. Revelation chapter 6. We're making our way through a series of messages on Sunday that I've entitled as Time Runs Out. We're making our way through the book of Revelation. We've come to chapter 6. Now next Sunday, Father's Day, and I want to encourage you to come with your family. And I've got a message that I'll share with our men, our fathers next Sunday. We'll deviate from our Revelation study and we'll come back to it the following Sunday. So let's look at chapter 6 this morning. I hope you'll open up your Bibles, take the outline provided for you today, and notice the title. When all hell breaks loose. <coughs> when all hell breaks loose. Thomas Carlyle, the philosopher, the Scottish philosopher of the 1800s, was summoned by Queen Victoria. The queen was worried about how things were going in her kingdom, and she was anxious to have the great philosopher's opinion on what he thought the future might look like. So he came, and she said to him, You are regarded as a prophet. Tell me, what do you think the future will be like? He paused for a moment, and then he said to the queen, I don't know, Your Majesty, but I do know Whatever it is, it will be bad. <laughs> Whatever it is, it will be bad. But friend, here's the truth. What the future looks like depends upon our decision concerning Christ. Can we say that again? Our future, the way the future looks like, depends upon our decision concerning Christ. If we receive Christ into our lives, as God told the prophet Isaiah, chapter 3, verse 10, Say unto the righteous that all shall be well with him. Friend, if we have been made right or righteous in Christ Jesus, the future is going to be well with us. But if we not, come to Christ and made a decision for Christ, then the future holds, what the future holds will be bad. In chapters 4 and 5, we spent some breathtaking time in the inspiring, soul-inspiring throne room of God. You remember the scroll that God was holding in His hand? The title deed of the earth has now changed hands. The Lamb has taken the scroll. He has the right to judge and possess what He's already purchased with His blood. The church has been caught up to heaven. That's the word the Apostle Paul used in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. It's the Greek word harpazo, which means caught up. The church has been caught up. We call it the rapture of the church. You remember Jesus told the church to be salt and light upon the earth. Without the church, there is no salt. Without the church upon the earth, there is no light. And without salt, putrefaction sets in. And without light, there is darkness. So I suggest to you, according to God's Word, the things upon the earth are about to get really bad. They're going to get stinky and dark. All hell is about to break loose. We call it the Great Tribulation. Now Jesus described the Great Tribulation in Matthew 24, 21. And I'm going to read the Good News translation. Listen to it. For the trouble at that time will be far more terrible than any there has ever been. From the beginning of the world to this very day, nor will there ever be anything like it again. Now the seven year tribulation is prophesied in the book of Daniel. Daniel was a teenager 
when he was taken into captivity in Babylon. He was used mightily by God as a representative in those days. And during these years, Daniel and the others must have thought many times, has God forgotten the covenant he made with our fathers? Will God ever allow us to return to our homeland? And if he will, when will he do that? Daniel was very concerned about God's reputation among the Gentile nations. You see, if God was incapable of providing his own people with a homeland, then what's the use of worshiping him? Daniel was concerned about the Gentiles' understanding of God. And he prays and he fasts. And he's asking God, how long is this going to last? When will we be able to return? When will you make Israel truly righteous? And you know what God did? God sent the angel Gabriel with answers to all his questions. And you find it over in Daniel chapter 9 and verse 24. This is what Gabriel said to Daniel, Seventy weeks are determined for your people and for your holy city to finish the transgressions, to make an end of this, to make reconciliation for iniquity, to bring an everlasting righteousness, to seal up visions and prophecy, and to anoint the most holy. The term 70 weeks here really means 70 sevens or 490 years. And from the time that there came that decree from Cyrus to a Jewish remnant that they could return and rebuild the temple until Jesus rode triumphantly into Jerusalem on a donkey is 483 years, leaving seven years remaining in God's dealing with Israel. Now here's what you need to remember. Because Israel rejected Christ, God pushed his stopwatch on that 490 year period. And the time that he pushed the stopwatch until the time that he comes for his church is called the church age. It's called the time of the Gentile. This is what Paul writes in Romans 11, 25. For I do not want you to be ignorant of this mystery. A partial hardening has happened to Israel until the fullness of the Gentile has Come. When the church age concludes and Jesus comes again, the time to deal with Israel will begin again. And there's seven years remaining. That is what we call the Great Tribulation. Remember that the reason we have the tribulation coming is for God to deal with Israel or redeem Israel and for the condemnation of the unbeliever. Now this tribulation period centers around three series of judgments. The seal judgments that we're going to look at this morning, the trumpet judgments, and the bowl or vial judgments. I believe they run concurrently or are the same, just with different symbolism. So let's begin here in chapter 6, this 14 chapter exciting journey that we call the tribulation period. Seven years. I noticed there in verse 1, the mentioning again of the living creatures. Look at verse 1. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals. And I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a voice like thunder. By the way, when you read the word thunder, you know that there's a storm approaching. A storm is approaching, friend. And look at 
hear what it says. Come and see. And I looked and behold a white horse. But notice the four living creatures. That's what I want to mention again. Some have, some have translations use the word beast. But that description is really incorrect because the Greek word here is zoa, which, from which we get our English word zoo. We first met them in chapter 4, if you remember, verses 6 and 7. They're around the throne. One is like a lion. One is like an ox. One has the face of a man. And the other is like an eagle. You remember that? Ezekiel, in his vision, pictures the same animals, the same uh, living creatures, but he calls them cherubim. Cherubim are the highest of the angel hierarchy. Here in Revelation, I believe they are symbolic for all the, the living uh, or creating order of God. But they're all around the throne and they're giving praise to God. I wanted you again to know that the living creatures are there and they are seraphim and uh, one is like a lion, one's like an ox, one has the face of a man, one is like an eagle. I want you to recognize this because it's the cherubim who look like these living creatures who are going to introduce each of these seals. Okay? Now the first four seals introduce for us four on horseback and riders on horseback and they are usually identified as the four horsemen of the apocalypse. Who are they? What are they doing? That's what we're going to look at today. We're going to look at six of the seals. The Lamb has taken the scroll. He is worthy to undo the, the seals. Notice the first one, verse 2. And I looked and behold a white horse. He who sat on it had a bubble and a crown was given to him. And he went out conquering and to conquer. The white horse. I believe, first of all, as we look at the white horse, we're talking about the counterfeit Christ. The counterfeit Christ. Some have suggested that the one on the white horse going out to conquer is Christ himself as he's pictured in chapter 19 of Revelation. But I believe this is a counterfeit Christ. A counterfeit of the real thing. A Christ wannabe. He's called the Antichrist. He is Satan incarnate. Prophecy tells us he will come on the scene at the beginning of the, the tribulation period. What's the church's goal? He will be free. To come and work unhindered. There's some other things I noticed here about this particular rider. Did you notice he was given a crown on his head? And the word crown here comes from the Greek word stephanos. We've already talked about that word. But it is the victor's crown. You see, if this rider was Jesus, he would not have been given a stephanos. He would have been given a diadema, which was or is the crown of the king, the kingly crown. And only Jesus Christ can wear a diadema because he's the king of kings. In Revelation 19, I noticed that he goes out with a two-edged sword. But did you notice this rider? He goes off with a bow. And I also noticed he doesn't have any arrows. So he's not going forth to kill. He's not going forth to shed blood. But he's going forth to conquer, the scripture says. I believe he's going to conquer with deception. Deception. He will deceive through a new political order and a new religious system. He will promise peace and sign a great peace treaty among the nations and Israel. The people and the nations of the earth will be greatly deceived. And they will follow him with great devotion. Genesis chapter 3 verse 1 says about Satan. He is more subtle than any beast of the field. This is how Daniel describes the Antichrist in 825. Though, or excuse me, through his cunning, he shall cause deceit to prosper under his rule. Friend, the masses will be deceived by his charisma, 
by his promises. And they will follow him with great devotion. Several years ago, someone called a lady whose husband drove a truck. He was gone often. He delivered packages. And this particular man that called had a professional sounding voice and he said, Mrs. Jones, this is Dr. Johnson. <clears throat> and I am sorry to inform you that your husband is in the hospital with a life-threatening unknown disease and may die. And we need a hair sample from you immediately because we believe that you may have contracted the disease also. The terrible news jolted the woman. And so this particular man on the phone instructed her to take a pair of scissors and cut off her hair as short as she could and send it quickly as she could to the hospital so they could run some lab tests. <laughs> she obeyed, obeyed, obeyed excuse me, uh, immediately did or obeyed what the man had asked. She cut off her hair. And after completing that, she said to the caller, okay, now what? And the man replied, the next thing I want you to do is wait for your husband to come home. I made up this entire story. <laughs> the prankster then hung up the phone. <coughs> Here, listen, Satan wants our perception to be based on deception. This woman acted on what she believed to be true. And we act, not necessarily upon the truth, but what we think is the truth. And Satan knows that. He knows how to get us to believe a lie. And on this study, and when this horse comes, and when this rider comes, when the Antichrist comes, the counterfeit Christ comes, and enters into the world scene, he'll go forth to conquer through deception. And man will follow, and he will follow with great devotion. The second horse, the fiery red horse, verses 3 and 4. I call this horse willful warfare. Look at what the scripture says. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come and see in another horse, fiery red went out. And he was granted to, to, and it was granted to the one who sat on, on, on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. Matthew chapter 24 verses 4 through 6 says take heed that no man deceives you for many shall come in my name saying I am the Christ and deceive many and you shall hear wars and rumors of wars. But be not troubled for all these things must come to pass the end is not yet. The rider of the white horse went out to deceive. The rider of this red horse he will go forth to kill. John says he will take away the peace and the people should kill one another. To me, that's willful or intentional killing. It is killing without remorse. <clears throat> Notice he's given a sword. In Bible prophecy, or in the Bible itself, from the Greek language, when it speaks of a sword, it's talking about a small sword used in close combat. And this rider will go forth and he will use that, that sword and there will be killing among the people. <coughs> the killing will know no boundaries. Nation against nation. Neighbor against neighbor. Brother against brother. The Hatfields and McCoys will seem like a pop gun shoot. This horse will bring willful, intentional killing. Killing without remorse will break loose upon this earth. Number three will be the black horse. The rider will come forth and there will be famine. I call it fatal famine. Look at verses five and six. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse. And he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures say, A quart of wheat for a denarii, and three quarts of barley for a denarii. 
Do not harm the oil and the wine. The color black is symbolic of famine. Famine always comes after the warfare. When everybody's involved in warfare, you see there's nobody to work the crops. There's nobody to, to, to plant the crops. There's no one to carry the crops to market. Famine follows war. You know what it appears to be? It appears that, that the economic system of the world is going to collapse and bring the world to her knees in utter poverty. Did you notice this writer comes forth and he's carrying an old timey scale? You know what that means? Food's going to be scarce. It's going to be measured and it's going to be rationed. Food's going to be expensive. A quart of wheat is a small amount. But it cost a denarii. One denarii was a working man's daily wage. You would work all day for a small piece of bread. A poor man's bread called barley bread wasn't quite as expensive. It was only slightly more reasonable. But can you imagine working all day for a small piece of bread? What about your family? What about your children? Do you give one the bread over another? Or you do you just divide it all out among your family so you can all starve to death together? There's going to be great famine when the tribulation comes. Number four horseman comes forth. It's the pale horse. I refer to this horse as disastrous death. Verses 7 and 8. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth angel, or the fourth living creature, say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse. And the name of him who sat on it was Death. And Hades followed with him. And power was given to him over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death. And by the beasts of the earth. Note the word pale. It comes from the Greek word chlorophyll. From that word, we get a lot of words. Many of you ladies, especially, will know about Clorox and the color of Clorox. Really, the, 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 the color to me is, a, is, an, is the color of a uh, decomposing corpse. That's what you get. Did you notice he's given the power to kill one-fourth of the earth? Today's population of the earth is six billion people. That means as this rider rides, 1.5 billion people are going to die. Can you imagine the stench? Can you imagine the disease? Now notice something here. Notice that this rider is given power to kill in several ways. He's given the power to kill with the sword, which is warfare. He's given the power to, to uh, kill with hunger. He's also given the power to kill through pestilence. But then, notice, it says he's given the power to kill with death. The fact that he uses death twice here seems a little redundant. I believe the last death speaks of diseases. Those ones, the ones that were once curable will have, will not be phased by any medication. Things like smallpox and diphtheria and malaria, these things are going to spread like wildfire. But then John says something else. Did you notice the last part? And by the beast of the earth. Now when we think of beast, we think of something big and ferocious. Dr. David Jeremiah and many other commentators suggest here that the beasts that would do the most damage are rats. The fleas, you remember, of rats carried the bubonic plague, which killed a third of the population of Europe in the 14th century. I read they multiply, multiply rapidly. I, re I read that they can carry, rats can carry up to 35 different diseases. So this writer is given the power to bring disastrous death. So that's the four horsemen of the apocalypse. The antichrist, the warfare, the famine, and the death. But there's some more seals to open. Number five, quickly, are the martyrs.
martyrs. Look at verses 9 through 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar of the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them. And it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed, future tense, is it, uh, will be killed as they were, was completed. The Greek word for martyr there is martus, which really means a witness. John says here in verse 9 that these were slain for the word of God and for their testimony. These were ones to me who died as the four horsemen rode and did their bidding. But let's notice three things about them quickly. First of all, their condition is expressed here in verse 9. It says, I saw under the altar the souls of those. You see that word souls there? The word soul refers to the mind, the will, and the emotion of a person. That, that, those are the things that make us who we are. And when we die, it's the soul that goes to paradise. Well, you notice that these among the altar are souls. They've not yet received their transformed body. They're in the spiritual state or spiritual body. They're in the same kind of body that our loved ones are in right now in paradise. It's a conscious state of existence. Did you notice they talk? Did you notice they see clearly with their eyes? Did you notice they're draped in the right white robes? Truly to be absent from the bodies to be present with the Lord. Amen. That's their condition, their souls. They've not yet received a transformed body. Notice verse 10, their cry. They're aware that their killers are continuing upon the earth and they're up to no good. They're up to their mischief. They're up to their rebellion. They're aware of what is occurring and they ask the Lord to go ahead and move swiftly to, to work His justice upon the earth. They're filled with anticipation. They can no longer wait upon the destruction of those who have taken their lives. So they cry out to the Lord. But then thirdly, notice the comfort in verse 11. They were told to rest for a while, for the martyrdom on the earth was not yet complete. Others would die. Let me tell you what Revelation 14, 13 says. Blessed are the dead which die in the Lord, for they will rest from their labors. I read a story one time about a preacher who went to visit one of his elderly members. She was nearing death and he began to talk to her about heaven and all that she would do in heaven and how she would do this and how she would sing here and do this over here. And finally she said, well, preacher, don't you think the Lord's just going to let you rest a little while? Yes. That's what Jesus says. Or the word comes to them. Rest from your labors. Rest for a little why? The martyrs are one scene. The final scene we're going to look at is the cosmic or cosmological chaos. I see that in verses 12 through 17. There's a lot of changes that happen upon this earth. As all hell breaks loose, look at verse 12. I looked when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, there was a great earthquake. The sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became like blood, and the stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in caves and in the rocks of the mountains and said to the mountains and rocks, Falls, hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the 
great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? In due time, there's going to be great cosmological changes in the universe. John sees them. He says, first of all, there's this great earthquake. Notice he doesn't say there's an earthquake. He says it's a great earthquake. In other words, it's one like has never been seen. It's unprecedented in history. It's unprecedented and indescribable. The sun will hide its hole by some form of an eclipse. And the moon will change its color to red. The stars will begin to fall. He would call it unprecedented notes. John says they're going to fall like the winter fields fall when there's a big wind. And then the sky is going to roll up. I don't know exactly what that means. But perhaps it could be that heaven is going to close for business. People are going to cry out. God's not going to hear. Because God's judgment is coming. Also, the verse tells us that there's going to be a whole lot of shaking going on. That the mountains are actually going to be moved and the waters are going to be moved. Can you imagine a mountain being shaken so bad that it actually changes or moves? Part here, part over there. Cosmological chaos. Things began to change. Great disorder in the universe. And finally, verse 16 tells us that the people are hiding in caves and rocks and crevices. But apart from Christ, there's no place to hide. No hiding place. It's amazing to me that the ones described here are of all kinds and all shapes and sizes, the rich, the poor, and they're hiding. And did you notice their prayer? Now they're praying for the rocks to fall upon them and take their lives. They had rather pray to the rocks than cry out or pray out to God when they had a chance. Isn't that amazing? Vance Havner once said, the day will come when the most expensive piece of land will be a hole in the ground. He's right. The day of the Lord has come. Now let me show you something as I close. In verse 17, do you see the word wrath? For the great day of his wrath has come. I took a moment and looked at that word. It comes from the Greek word orgy which speaks of a violent explosion. You know what that says to me? The wrath of God has been brewing for, from, for thousands of years. The wrath of God has been brewing for all of history. And now it explodes upon the earth. The Bible says, be not deceived. God is not mocked for whatever man sows. He will one day reap. Now you're probably sitting there thinking, Brother Matt, are you trying to scare me? Is it working? Are you trying to scare me to give my life to Christ? Is that what it's going to take? The Bible says in Proverbs 1.17, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. It ought to scare us. It ought to open our eyes. We have to accept it as truth, and it is truth. One <clears throat> day, all hell will break loose. And friend, the only place to flee from the wrath of God is Calvary. Calvary. I'll close with this. In 1830, a man by the name of George Wilson killed a government employee who caught him stealing the mail. Wilson was tried. He was sentenced to be hanged. 
But for some reason, the President of the United States at the time, Andrew Jackson, sent Wilson a pardon. But Wilson did a strange thing. He refused to accept the pardon. What do you do when someone ex won't accept the pardon? Well, it went all the way to the Supreme Court. And Chief Justice Marshall wrote this opinion. A pardon is a slip of paper the value of which is determined by the acceptance of the person to be pardoned. If it is refused, <coughs> it is no pardon. George Wilson must be hanged. And he was. Friend, listen to me. The death of Jesus Christ on the cross is God's pardon to mankind. But if we reject it, it's no void in our lives. If we don't want to accept it, we don't have to accept it. But we will die and be eternally separated from God. But if we accept the death of Christ on the cross for the forgiveness of our sins, we can have pardon and eternal life. You see, what we do with Christ really determines our future, doesn't it? If we receive Him into our high hearts, all is going to be well. But if we don't, all is going to be bad. That's as clear as I can put it. Let's pray. Father, thank You for Your Word. It is so powerful and so amazing. And Father, it's hard for us to fathom in our own minds the kind of wrath that will explode upon this earth in what we call, and the Bible calls, the day of the Lord. But may we understand that it's been building up for, for the years of history. Man rejecting God, ridiculing God, blaspheming His name. May we understand that there's coming a day when all hell will break loose upon this earth. And the wrath of God will explode. And the unbeliever will be condemned. <coughs> May we understand that we can be prepared by accepting Christ into our lives. Thank you, Jesus, for dying for our sins that we might have your lasting life. Because in you, there is no condemnation. The Bible says there is no condemnation to those who believe. We thank you, praise you, for what you've provided for us. May we hear and may we heed your word today. In Jesus' name, I our heads are bowed and eyes are closed. God is moving in this place, touching lives, awakening us to the truth of the future. If there's anyone here today, friend, I want to encourage you to come give your heart and life to Jesus. If you'll come say, Brother Matt, I want Jesus in my heart, I'll tell you what to do. You must receive him by faith. And believe in your heart that he is God and he's risen from the Life. You must believe that his death upon the cross is sufficient to save you and give you eternal life. If you believe that, you'll come today by faith. I'll lead you in a prayer of receiving the Lord. Let the Lord speak to your heart right now. There may be some others here today who need to come join the church with another church. You want to come to the altar and pray. Let the Lord speak to your heart today as well. This is His invitation. It's not mine. So let me best I know how. Just turn it over to the Spirit of God now. And let Him work in our hearts. Let's stand together. Let's sing. And you come.